Okay, welcome everybody. This is our third matchmaking session for XPRIZE Carbon Removal. I'm Rupa Dandamudi. I'm the team relations manager for this prize. So you might have heard from me via email or seen me on a webinar. Um, also here we have Michael Leach, who's our technical director and uh, um, Nikki Bachelor, who is our prize director. So the format for this meeting is um, each team is going to present and share their screen when I call them out, uh, when I call their name. First up, we have uh, Team Maloon. This is um, going to be presented by Stefan Nottensteiner. All right, so um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to um, share our solution. So in the end, we use a membrane-based process to filter CO2 um, directly from the air or we implement it into um, like industrial um, processes. Um, you can see here a, um, a visualization how it works or should work in the pilot project. So as you can see, we have um, several membranes so there are not only one membrane because we recycle it so that we have a higher concentration in the end and then um, we store it and um, we convert it into co2 so um eh, sorry convert it into graphene and this graphene we use for our membranes in the end we have a circular economy in place and that helps us not only to um to store the co2 long term we have a, a usage of it, and at the same time, we can reduce our costs per ton. Um, for this, we need chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, people who are really deep in the graphene um, space, and um, in the long run, an account manager for it. Um, our team is based on me and Dr. Suleiman Kozam. Um, I myself uh, running the business development and he is running the product development. His background is in um, biophysics and my background is um, international management. So I hope you have uh, understanding what we are doing and happy to, to speak with you afterwards. Thank you. Um, Laura with, with Mortar, Team Mortar, are you ready to present? Okay, so I'm Laura from Team Mordor Technology. Um, I'm located in New Zealand. Uh, we picked this name because CO2 can only be destroyed from where it was forged, so deep within a geological formation, such as Mount Doom. Um, a huge amount of CO2 is produced at industrial sites, including mining operations. Um, so this will be filtered through a zeolite membrane and captured um, and transported to a number of locations. These range from geological formations um, within the deep ocean or reduced oil reservoirs. Um, so there's been research carried out that 1,800 to 20,000 billion metric tons of CO2 can be stored underground in the US. Um, and there's options to turn it into mineral carbonates and diamonds. All right, so underground storage. So CO2 is produced at industrial sites, including coal-fired power plants and steel refineries. And this will be filtered through a zeolite membrane. And the captured CO2 can then be transported or directly pumped into storage. All right, so the filter. Uh, the membrane's made of zeolite. So uh, the material is more thermally stable and less likely to be damaged um, by pressure and high pressure gas streams. Um, it's a layered porous membrane containing a, a ceramic support, which is coated in a molecular sieve. Um, due to pressure differences across the membrane, the gas will pass through and the residue, which doesn't pass through, is adsorbed, which would be the CO2, and then it's separated out and sent to underground storage. 
And that's a long-term solution. So um, many studies have been carried out on natural track pockets of CO2. So the cap rock material is very stable and it doesn't um, dissolve even when carbonated water reacts. So it's a reliable long-term solution. And for the team, um, so we're looking for anyone really, like hobbits in particular, but um, we've signed up as a student team. So we are looking mostly for students, but we need at least 50% students in the team. So um, anyone can join. Um, someone with an engineering background, science program and design, that sort of thing. Um, or if we've got good PR skills, then we'd be interested in hearing from you. So sign up to Team Order. Thank you. We'll come back to Azula Proxima. Um, team Cryojet, Howard Meyer. Are you ready to share your screen, please? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Team Cryojet uh, direct air capture technology. Uh, common to a lot of the direct air capture systems, uh, there's a lot of air that needs to be moved uh, through the system. Uh, there's a lot of mechanical pieces of equipment that is necessary to move and to provide regeneration. Uh, these are mostly have some amount of carbon footprint to them uh, with large fans, with large compressors. Uh, so Team Cryo is looking at a low cost, negative, net negative uh, durable CO2 removal. We're able to get higher conversions or uh, captures of CO2 rather than 50 to 70%, we're looking at 90% plus. That means we're having less air uh, movement. And we're replacing those mechanical blowers, refrigeration equipment with ejector systems. The ejector systems are being driven by low cost carbon free energy sources such as process waste heat or low grade uh, renewable energy. And those greatly reduce the cost of equipment and also maintenance uh, and overall lowering the cost. What we're doing with the CO2 is desupplementing it out of the air. Uh, if you think about desublimation, that's moving directly from a gas to a solid. So this is a phase diagram. Uh, air contains uh, 0.4, uh, 0.04% uh, CO2. Uh, so uh, by volume, uh, we're gonna cool that gas down uh, so that it hits the sublimation, desublimation line. Uh, we're going to be cooling it down to some minus 150 degrees centigrade, and that's going to desublimate out 90% of the CO2. Uh, those temperatures sound large, but if you think about cryogenic air separation, uh, they're cooling down to minus 170, 100, almost 200 degrees below zero. So those are achievable temperatures. Uh, when we have the solid, we're able to compress it and uh, to the solid and then heat it up so that we can have a liquid or a supercritical CO2 product uh, that is ready for sequestration or application. Uh, much easier and less energy required to compress the solid and warm it in, than it will be to uh, compress air, or I'm sorry, compress CO2 uh, to the required temperature for sequestration. While this can be done in uh, large central uh, facilities uh, in the mega tons a, a year application, it can also be used in smaller uh, systems uh, where it can be tied into uh, heat generation uh, systems for uh, large buildings, uh, where solar is providing the energy for the plant and the cryojet is using waste heat uh, to collect CO2 on a distributed standpoint. Uh, what we're looking for in partners are some uh, 
people that are involved technically in thermal energy and drop handling slurries of uh, dry ice. Uh, we understand that there's going to be a lot of animation control, automation and control and, and IT that's required. And we're looking for investors and startup business experience. Right now, our team consists of Wilson Engineering Technologies, California Gas Technology Institute uh, in Illinois, Purdue Northwest, uh, and uh, some professors in UK and in uh, Soviet Union. Uh, we're looking for partners and invite you to join us in the breakout room uh, to talk about the technology. So thank you very much. So next up we have Azola Proxima. Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Benjamin Harrell and today I will be presenting for team Azola Proxima. We're based in Shanghai, China and here's my email. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about when talking about CO2 capture is the major challenges that are involved in such an endeavor. So basically, the biggest challenge I see is the energy penalty that is associated with traditional C CCS energy uh, technology. So basically 60% of the energy used is used in the capture of CO2, and then 30% is used in the compression of CO2, and then another 10% 10, 10 for the pump. So um, our goal at Proxima at Sola is to reduce this energy penalty by up to 20 to 40 percent by uh, compressing the CO2 in a more passive way. Uh, another main challenge of CO2 capture at the moment is the cost and time associated with uh, carbon capture. Right now we're, we're in a race. We, we're a race against the clock at the moment, so we need to get this up as soon as possible. So what we want to do is we want to take advantage of the growth of the aerospace industry to capitalize on that and <laughs> yeah, provide service in the form of lower cost carbon negative fuel. So what we want to do is we want to take um, our, our project, which is called STARS. STAR stands for Starship Terraton carbon acquisition and uh, removal system. It consists basically of a biomass reactor, uh, a number of anaerobic digesters and a storage device that we are currently working on. Um, it tries to bridge the gap between Starship and CCS technology. And it just will enable the push towards the gigascale by 2030. So, the kind of numbers that have been calculated is I'm I'm seeing that in total we can we can capture over 300 uh, kilotons of CO2 a year, and then after we uh, factor out the the carbon emissions from Starship itself, um, we can get between 13 and 177 kilotons net removal. Okay. And here is just a basic overview of our process. What we do is we take autonomous floating bioreactors. Um, they're cheaply made. And what they do is they reduce the space requirements for um, that's, that's compared to other like C CCS technologies. So uh, other ocean-based solutions, they have to import in all their nutrients. So what we do is we take the nutrients and we put it in a continuous loop. And the only thing that we take out is the, the methane produced and the, the, car, the carbon dioxide. So not many people know that when you uh, go through anaerobic digestion, the resulting mixture is uh, about 40% uh, methane and about 60% CO2 based on how you do it. And what we do is we take that CO2 and that methane and we separate it, trying to leverage the pressure of the ocean and then uh, we try to store it in an environmentally safe, long-term long storage solution. Uh, the kind of skills that we need for our team are mechanical engineers. Um, we're looking for a few aerospace engineers, some legal support, 
a few machine learning scientists to work on the automation part and uh, any kind of expert in the biogas field. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Benjamin. So Hill Camp with Team Undesert is up next. Hello, my name is Hill Camp. I'm one of the co-founders of Undesert. And um, our, our technology, with our technology, we uh, grow um, commercial forests in raw desert, storing gigaton levels of CO2 using the modular technology you see in the picture. We convert the scrubland you see behind those two people into standing commercial forest. And we use available uh, salty water to irrigate the commercial forest. And the thing about this is the floods and droughts and forest fires that are all over today's headlines are heating up an already hot $200 billion carbon capture market. Our technology shown at the upper left is patented internationally. It's been operating now for two years, producing food in the raw desert outside of Dubai and UAE. And we're now fo laser focused on carbon capture. The upper right photograph shows a variety of our variety of trees growing in the New Mexico desert a few miles from our, uh, our current dem op operating demo site. We, we convert carbon dioxide into usable wood products. One of the things about our solution is we do not compete with for either land or water with other land uses. We convert scrub land to bare desert from, from and bare desert to 80 foot tall dense forest. Our target land is not in use and is cheaply available. Our innovation, our innovation can actually reverse global warming using only 2% of the available desert and available in idle desert, I should say. Now here are a couple of examples from that $200 billion market I mentioned. Shell is spending over $100 million a year buying carbon credits, many of them in remote locations overseas. And they are uh, paying dearly for those things. And in some cases, those, those remote locations the, the, the carbon capture is actually fraudulent. UPS is another company. Uh, they are running 123,000 trucks, uh, contributing uh, 10 metric tons a year per truck. They are buying hundreds of thousands of uh, tons of carbon capture every year. Uh, we, we can, we're in dis actually in discussion with both of these companies as a, as a, first, as a first start. So when we convert um, idle desert to concentrated forests, forests, we capture CO2, replace it with pure oxygen and sequester the carbon in usable products at the gigaton level for decades. We seek help in, in forestry. Desert forestry is not a very big area right now. We're the only ones. Uh, so we seek area in, in forestry and also uh, people with a, a good, good net, marketing people with a good network of very large companies. In summary, we take undrinkable water, unusable land and unlimited sunshine and create undesert. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Hill. So the next team up we have is X-Mint, uh, Dong Ju Lee. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dong Ju Lee, the CEO and the founder of the X-Mint. It's extraction, our company is, we do the extraction mineral. Uh, we uh, actually uh, extract minerals from seawater. So that's why it's X-Mint. So the world already knows that the planting tree is the best solution for removing carbon dioxide. 
The reason why planting tree is the best way is due to the half of the weight of the tree is actually carbon. Um, however, it is not realistic. It's because it's expensive to plant and we do not have enough lands to plant it. So to overcome the difficulties, instead of planting new trees, uh, we have the solution, which we have this technology that can use the current trees, uh, use the current trees in the forest to remove the carbon dioxide. So the trees are currently facing undernourishment in many parts of the world. Uh, people would think in a forest, the soil is, has a really a lot of um, nutrients, but it's not. It is because the soil is lacking in nutrients because many of them are carried away, washed away by rainfalls. So this leaves trees not reaching their full potential. So this causes them to not be able to reach the optimal level to grow, which allows them to, which not allow them to, not allowing them to take, uh, absorb carbon dioxide. So we have the technology available to collect large amounts of seawater and spread it into three parts. Uh, we, we can produce pure H2O salt and sea minerals. So the focus of our initiative will be to utilize the sea minerals and apply them to trees to incre increase their growth rate. The conventional seawater desalination, uh, we, we call it CSD, uh, is cheapest and efficient way to collect those minerals to help uh, remove carbon dioxide. And so our research shows that um, our research and calculation is showing that if we apply sea minerals to trees, the growth rate of the tree is increased by 20%, which is from 3.7% to 4.4% per year. So that means uh, if we apply, uh, we can help trees to absorb extra four gigatons per year if we apply to the trees just in the United States. Um, there's about 9% of the trees in the United States. So, Again, this is possible because 40, 40, about half of the weight of the tree is consistent with carbon. So I, I only prepared five slides. So um, thank you. If you have any questions, please, uh, please uh, contact me through this email. So I can um, more explain about our CSG, how it works, and also show how we calculate the numbers for removing carbon dioxide. Thank you. Oh, and then just one more thing. Um, uh, I'm from South Korea and then we're based on uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And our, we, we currently have seven team members and five of them are in Massachusetts and the other two there are working from Korea and Singapore. And we need a person who's really who's expert in you know, knowing trees and then who can conduct the experiment with trees, I think. And also investors, thank you. Okay, great, thank you, Donji. Blue Sky, Team Blue Sky. Ready to go. Hi guys, my name is Will Hessert. I'm CEO of Blue Sky. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur for a few years, uh, mainly in technical fields like software, uh, and other areas that have helped fund our carbon capture venture. So Blue Sky is built on the premise of rethinking uh, the frame of carbon capture because the goal is always a reduction in cost in hopes that future carbon pricing by world governments will be able to cover that cost. Uh, our idea is based on not particularly having faith in governments and trying to make the process of capturing carbon a profitable endeavor. So our idea to do this, uh, so we're sequestering carbon dioxide by growing biomass uh, as any form of biomass grown will take carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, we're focused on it being algae specifically because algae will not compete uh, for cropland, not contribute to deforestation, and also it is pretty uh, reasonable on using water. So using genetically engineered algae, every a uh, kilogram of algae grown is about 1.83 kilograms of CO2 taken out of the air. Now, if you just leave that algae there, uh, it will undergo um, uh, anaerobic digestion and all that CO2 will go back to the atmosphere. So it has to be converted to a stable form. 
So we turn it mainly into charcoal, also known as biochar through pyrolysis. So you heat it up in a low oxygen environment. Uh, but the byproducts of this reaction, as well as other processes that we have, can also create carbon neutral jet fuel, biodiesel, and very profitable products like plastics, carbon fiber, and graphene, uh, which all have a very uh, high price, which can then be sold to offset the costs involved in growing the algae and then producing the charcoal. And where we're at now, uh, we have our rapid growth algae selected. We're currently experimenting with that in order to figure out how to maximize the growth. Uh, and we're focusing on, on increasing revenue and raising funds to be able to complete a kilo complex, which will capture a thousand metric tons a year uh, by the end of 2022 uh, as part of our entry into this uh, XPRIZE competition. So right now we're focused on growing our team. Uh, so really we actually have a couple of other uh, ventures in other areas, all in regards to reducing carbon emissions that are helping fund this project. So any and all skill sets are welcome to apply. Uh, anything from uh, the obvious things like chemical engineering and manufacturing engineering to even uh, customer service and construction and especially investors. Uh, if this works and you invest, you'll probably be very rich. So please uh, feel free to send along um, any offers for that. But uh, culturally, what we're looking for is really just a deep passion in solving this problem, uh, really self-motivated and uh, a work ethic on a level where you're the kind of person where your mom calls you to make sure that you remember to eat. Um, that's really the kind of culture we're, we're looking to develop. But once again, I'm Will Hesser. Uh, that is my uh, direct cell uh, that you can call me at it at any time. Uh, that is in two in the morning. And uh, will.hessert at bluesky.io is my email. And anyone who's interested, look forward to speaking to you later. And I will hand you back to your host. Okay, thank you, William. Okay, Nico Dowling, we're going to come back to you. This is Team Ghost Print. Hello, I'm Nico, the Growing Guru, and this is our ghost print prototype. So this is our prototype that we have working in our greenhouse. We call it the G3 Sanctuary, and it takes carbon, captures it. We actually followed a really good team because we're also capturing our carbon through biomass, and we have prototyped a algae bioponic bucket system so far that takes the digestate at a small scale, which just comes from food waste and from carbon. And then it takes it and turns it obviously into a biomass, which can be used to go back into the biodigester or to create things like bioplastics and like packaging material the materials of the future that i think we all know uh x prize is looking for and so we're basically taking trash and turning it back into a sense we're turning it into like trees you know like plates and carbon sequestering materials and then those can come back and it's a regenerative closed loop system. So the final aspect that is our bread and butter in a sense is taking it and putting it back into the ground via, we've calculated it with the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. Anybody in the space has probably heard of him. And so on about 80 acres of land using a I can give them a shout out to Comacary Bioenergy, who's a fellow competitor. We've used their numbers um, and the size of their biodigester and come up with about 15,000 tons of metric tons of carbon sequestered per year. So if you check it out, this system can be used while it's lagging. The system can be used to create anything uh, like the biogas. I really like that you can use it to create electricity, to power the trucks that deliver the products and pick up the compost, or you could use it to heat your greenhouses. And that's where we're sequestering back the carbon. And of course you can use it in not a flamethrower that can, you can compress it as you can see over here. Hopefully my computer will go forward 
eventually on yeah okay so here is our growing guru team we have a we're a startup team really college based obviously that's why we're in the university competition and we have a pretty well rounded team for the startup other than maybe like some some higher up people that can help lead us through challenges. We definitely have advisors on the team. I'm pretty well connected in Denver and a lot of my professors and fellow uh, mentors and advisors again are aware of this project and are helping guide us through the process. So it's a definitely a good, we got also um, one of the things that I want to highlight is that we are in a innovative lab. It's called Inworks, and this is where we're able to prototype for building anything from we want to make a compostable table, but we also want to make like cool new products such as dyeing our socks and making merchandise to help get the brand recognition out there. This shirt right here is custom made with all eco-friendly inks and eco-friendly materials, organic materials, so it can go back into the system and actually sequester carbon. Mm, I'm going to, my computer is still not loading forward, so I'm just gonna jump into the next slide, which is who we need and really this is again technical support like hardware software engineers that are experts with creating we basically want to make this whole system like a robot we think that the industry of anaerobic digestion has come far enough and now it needs to move into the 21st century and that's going to be a huge competitive edge so working with our partners we are planning to move into larger scale production with the funding that we get. Still not moving forward. Oh my goodness. Um, and the other thing that we need is some political like support. We're definitely going for grants, land grants. Um, we are kind of a unicorn of 501c3 because we believe that everybody deserves access to fresh food, clean water and clean electricity. Um, and so that kind of sets us apart. I can just throw it in the group chat. I have all of our contact information. So if you guys want to reach out, my graphic designer did a really good job on it. And I'd love to throw the screenshot in the uh, group chat for anybody that wants to join teams or collaborate on this project or wants to contribute in any other way. Next up, we have Daniel Walmsley with Gravity Rail. My name is Daniel Wormsley, and uh, thanks for giving me your time today. Um, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, so my team's approach is to capture carbon by growing biomass in large quantities, similar to other people here. I'm currently focused on algae. Uh, the main reason being that a 55 gallon drum of water can grow as much algae as an acre of forest and can do so without competing for arable land. Um, the reason for doing this in comparison with like mechanical or electrochemical uh, approaches is because it doesn't rely on large amounts of, of energy that it would have to be zero emissions energy and would compete. Uh, you know, it's already under pressure to replace fossil fuels. Um, hoping to grow this using recycled infrastructure, um, at, you know, kind of networked into a large scale bioreactor. So we're just thinking like swimming pools, oil barrels, ponds, lakes, like kind of buckets, like anything uh, that can hold water should be able to grow biomass. Um, again, cause like the embodied energy of like building an industrial size, like a planetary scale infrastructure for carbon capture is like not something we've got time for and is kind of self-defeating in the short term um, and highly regulated and expensive. Um, so, to facilitate the large scale cultivation of biomass, the idea is to develop a cheap piece of electronics, kind of like a Raspberry Pi type thing with a bunch of sensors on it. Um, uh, maybe LTE or Wi Fi connectivity. Um, no display or anything to think to, to speak of, just like connects to your phone. Um, and it's capable of measuring a few basic data points. Um, 
you know, using using sonar, it can measure like the volume of the container. It can also measure the opacity, turbidity, CO2 concentration, pH, and other things from the water using a small kind of like low cost sensor suite. Doesn't have to be super accurate, just sort of like basic indicators. Um, and uh, the idea would be to start out by actually publishing this as a set of instructions, then a kit, and then finally trying to manufacture at, at scale. Um, uh, each $5 unit would be minimally capable of um, uh, growing algae in, in uh, 20,000 gallons of water, which is about the size of a home swimming pool, um, but they can be combined into larger volumes. Um, this actually came out of an original idea that was way sillier, maybe, of creating um, a billion <laughs> ocean-bound robots made out of recycled oil barrels. And like, I'm not super great at robot manufacturing, but I know how to do like small electronics. Um, so I've decided to focus on the bit that I could do. Um, so the user experience is to uh, clamp this thing on the edge of any body of water and connect your phone and follow instructions. And it just says like, add algae, exposed to more light, stir, stir whatever, right? Um, it's not looking for it like anything super sophisticated that you couldn't find around your own home. Um, but if we are, um, uh, in terms of biomass disposal, there's been some people focused on that, uh, like, you know, do we turn into biochar, that kind of thing. I live in California, where in 2022, there's going to be mandatory um, statewide uh, biomass disposal that's zero emissions. So, like, I'm not worried about that part of the problem here. But, like, you know, obviously, as we scale up, you want to have that in, in various places and various forms. Um, and the goal of the system is actually um, sustained exponential growth, uh, basically, internet economics, like, taking my experience with startups of various kinds and just sort of trying to um, eliminate any roadblocks to, to um, sustained exponential growth up to and past the point where it actually sequesters the right amount of carbon. Um, why me? I've got two young kids and uh, I want them to live on a habitable planet. Um, and um, I studied under Al Gore as part of the second cohort for the climate project. Uh, visited a bunch of countries and presented the climate project uh, slideshow, the Inconvenient Truth slideshow all over the world and have encountered every form of like resistance <laughs> that's possible. Um, I've also been involved in a bunch of startups um, scaling up interventions around um, politics and the internet. I currently work on WordPress, which is 40% of the web. So I have a lot of like large scale data skills and other, you know, um, technical skills. Um, basically, I'm looking for people to get this project out of one head and into multiple heads. <laughs> like, I don't really mind, like, you know, what it is that brings you to this idea. But if you feel motivated by it, um, I think it's just important to start having this be more than one person. So then maybe I can have more than one slide. Um, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you. That's it. Great, thank you, Dan. Let's see, the last team is C-Sync with Ram Amar. So we, we're called C-Sync because um, we want to sink carbon uh, and kind of um, our, our, our way of thinking about it was, how was oil made? Let's do that again. So where is the CO2 going to be captured? We, we look at existing agriculture as a great way to sequester carbon from the air. Global produce is definitely in the gigaton scale. Uh, if you add to that um, green waste and the food industry waste, you take just the clean organic uh, carbon, you've got gigatons of trash, of carbon in trash. Today it's trash. We want to make something valuable out of it. Uh, where are we going to store it? In deep anoxic uh, waters, um, maybe paralyzed to make it inert, maybe not, depends on, on the results of our research. Uh, the Black Sea happens to be the largest anoxic body of water in the world. Um, we did the calculations of one gigaton of carbon would be uh, covering half a percent of the bottom of the Black Sea. In, in a one meter thick kind of layer. Um, also, uh, other advantages of the Black Sea are the countries around it that, that are considered the breadbasket of Europe. Turkey, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria together grow about 300 million tons of produce per year. And the rivers uh, around the Black Sea offer a cheap way to, to ship down the carbon 
and use uh, use gravity. So it's cheap in terms of uh, money and in terms of fuel and, and other emissions. What's the challenge? Because up until now, it sounds like easy peasy. Why, why aren't we doing it already? <laughs> uh, well, there's absolutely no political or social support for this concept because to most people, it sounds like why throw trash in the black sea? It's already super polluted. Why add more pollution? So we want to prove two things. One, that the sequestration efficiency or in academic words, the rate, the breakdown rate of the organic matter in the black sea is on the century scale. And two, we want to show that there are minimal environmental effects. So nothing really changes in the, in the environment of the deep black sea. Uh, so this is an academic research. We want to fund it and, and publish academic papers uh, on it and also do kind of uh, stakeholder uh, work with uh, the country's uh, NGOs and governments and municipalities around the Black Sea uh, to gain their, the, this political and social support. And if we have enough uh, fuel in the tank, then we'll also try to approve um, a new category for getting carbon credits to fund, fund this operation. Um, there's also, the, yeah, this is, uh, this is what we want, who we are. We're a collaboration of Israeli and German um, um, marine ecologists and biologists with plenty of experience, decades of experience in environmental assessments. And uh, who do we need? Um, more biologists, uh, biogeochemists, oceanographers, people who like the sea, but also mechanical engineers because just thinking raw biomass doesn't work that easily. Uh, and also supply chain, people who work with supply chain and can kind of think with us on the costs and in terms of money and emissions for doing that. And like I said, this sounds like why pollute the Black Sea. So we also need good storytellers. That's us. Thanks for listening. Okay, thanks, Rom. So that is it for our presenters. Thank you all 